So you will know that Pressure is a brand new play. It's a world premiere written by David Haig and starring David Haig. And it's part of the Hidden History season here. Uh, three plays that have been commissioned to tell about um, sort of key turning points, if you like, in history uh, that sometimes are underestimated in their importance. Um, so because this is an extraordinary and momentous day, and I think most people have been watching the television, and I suspect looking around and listening to the conversations earlier, almost everybody in the house tonight has some connection with D-Day, um, either themselves or with a parent. Um, my, my dad wasn't there on D-Day, but he went across on D-Day plus 19, and I suspect many of you have stories that you will share with other people later. But what, therefore, we decided to do was have a talk about the most extraordinary thing, which is that, possibly, the weather forecast for that day could be said to be the most important weather forecast in history. Because if they had got it wrong, or done it when they thought they might have done it, would any of us be sitting here now? We just can't say. So it's the most extraordinary thing. And so David's play, Pressure, is about the emotional uh, decisions about D-Day, but also the meteorological ones which informed everything. So we are incredibly honoured and delighted to have Dr Andrew Charlton Perez, who is Assistant Professor of Meteorology at the University of Reading. Reading is the only university in the country that does both undergraduate and postgraduate uh, courses in meteorology and the university is incredibly supportive of this talk and we are very grateful to them for releasing Andrew just for a couple of hours uh, to do this. Um, Andrew won the 2007 L.F. Richardson Prize of the Royal Meteorological Society and what he's going to do tonight is give a lecture about that extraordinary decision and how it worked. It is going to be unlike our normal talks, a straight through lecture. Um, and we do, as you know, need to give the house back to the actors, uh, bang on time at quarter to seven. But Andrew very kindly has said that he will be outside afterwards. So anybody who either wants to share a particular story or wants to ask specific questions, he will be there to do that for you. And there are also some handouts and particular things that will inform the talk. Um, to be had out there as well. Those of you who've seen the play will know that the science of this matters. Those of you who are going in tonight are in for a treat. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Andrew Carton Perez. Well, th thanks very much and, and thanks for, for having me. Um, so, so what I want to, to talk about tonight really is how difficult I think it was to make the D-Day weather forecasts. And I want to kind of link it through to, at the end, think about how still how difficult it would be to make that weather forecast today. So let's start from, from James Stagg. Here he is. He's the, um, the subject, the hero of the play, if you like. Um, and the point of the play is about, at least in my reading, is about deciding between two different ways of making a weather forecast. And those two different ways can kind of be summed up by these two people. So they weren't the only people involved in making the weather forecast, but they were very important. The top one of those is a guy called Sver Pettersen. He was a Norwegian. He was a self-made man. He came from a very small fishing village in the north of Norway, um, paid for his study through university, uh, and was such a, uh, a kind of brilliant meteorologist, brilliant scientist, that just before the, the start of war, he'd gone over to the US and was the head of a new department of meteorology at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, which is a very big and famous university in the US. And the other person there is a guy called Irving Crick. He's a very different um, person. He, he features a lot in the play. He was an American. Um, and he was kind of um, almost the world's first commercial weather forecaster. So um, he had all sorts of jobs before he became a weather forecaster. He was a trader. He was a pianist for a while. Um, and in the end, he, he, he got into meteorology, trained as a meteorologist. Um, and, and he was uh, involved in setting up the Department of Meteorology at, at the California Institute of, of Technology. And he had a very particular way of forecasting the weather, which we'll talk about a bit later. And he was most famous in the US because he'd used this commercial knowledge to give weather forecasts to Hollywood and all sorts of things um, that were very high profile. Most famously, he gave the forecast to the filmmakers for the burning of Atlanta when they filmed Gone with the Wind um, and was proved to be successful in giving that forecast. So he's very famous for that. 
So we have sort of two different schools of thoughts here. And Pettersson, um, in particular, embodies a school of thought about meteorology which was um, and, and became over the 20th century probably the dominant way of thinking about weather and weather systems. Um, and up here are, are several of the people who are instrumental in that, um, that way of thinking. And they were from something called the Norwegian School or the Bergen School of Meteorology. Um, so we have Wilhelm Björkness, who's the guy um, up here, top left. He was kind of the father of this movement, if you like. And this is his son, Jacob. And this is another very famous meteorologist, Carl Gustav Rosby. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about what these people did and why were they, they were so famous and how their ideas fed into Pettersson and, and the forecast that he made you know, with his colleagues. What I also want to do is kind of link the forecast that was made on D-Day to the kind of weather forecasts we make today. And at least in my, in my mind, there are a few other people who are really important to the story of how we got to where we are today. Um, this is one of them. This is, this is one of my heroes. This is Elif Richardson. Um, and he's really one of the fathers of the kind of numerical, computational way of producing weather forecasts, which is the dominant way that we make weather forecasts today. And then a little bit later on, uh, a little bit of a younger um, person in this, this group is, is really the father of chaos theory, a guy called Ed Lorenz. And as, as I'm sure you're all aware, um, his sort of most famous gift to the world, at least in the popular imagination, is this idea that the flapping of a butterfly's wings in Mexico leads to a tornado in Texas. Um, so it's the idea that um, small uncertainty, small changes can lead to big consequences at the end. And that, that really has a big impact on how we make weather forecasts today. And, and all of that, these people through here and all that feeds through into the kind of weather forecasts we see on our TV every morning. So let's get started. What, what is a weather forecast? And this is something that Wilhelm Björkness wrote down um, around the turn of the 20th century, 1904 or 5. Basically, what you're imagining is you have some estimate of what's happening now, the current weather conditions. You have a model. You put those things together, and you make a forecast. So a very silly example is that if you wanted to forecast who was going to win the premiership this year, you might look at the league table a few, a few games before the end of the season. Apologies to any Liverpool fans in the audience. You then might have a, have a model of what would happen, which would take into account all different factors which come together. And then by combining these pieces of information together, you would make a forecast. Of course, unfortunately for Liverpool, you may have made a bad forecast this year, but we'll, we'll leave that to, to one side for a moment. So let's think about, in the context of the play, in the context of D-Day, how were... Um, Stagg and his contemporaries getting a view of the atmosphere. How were they understanding what was happening in the atmosphere right now? So this is a line from the play that some, some of you will have heard or see later. So Stagg says, I need everything. Look at this room. I need a Dines anemometer. I need a Stevenson screen. I need thermometers. I need a barograph. I need a barometer. I need a telephone. Um, and we can see, you know, there are some props, and you'll see them later on, on the set, which kind of look a lot like this. Um, and there are all sorts of ways of measuring different facets of the atmosphere. And what I've put on the table outside, which some of you may have seen, uh, are some slightly more modern instruments and then some, some really modern instruments which do some of the same jobs as these um, pieces of kit here. So I think, um, just as an example, here's one of the dials at the top here, and this is connected to the Dines anemometer. That's what's measuring the wind speed and direction on the roof of this sort of you know, fictional forecasting room, if you like. So you collect all this information, and what do you do with it? So let's just think about how much information they had on D-Day. How good a view of the atmosphere did they have? So this is a picture of um, a, a sort of best estimate of all the places that they were making measurements um, around the time of, of D-Day. This is for the 5th of June. So one thing you can see there is it's pretty sparse. There, there, are, there are quite a lot of observations, many more than there would have been out of wartime, but still there's, there's very, very few places there where they're measuring the atmosphere. In comparison, if we look at all the places that they're measuring temperature or pressure or things about the atmosphere today, um, this is an example from the middle of May, 
And this is showing the whole world now, but you can see it's absolutely covered in dots. It's, it's completely um, smeared with dots. So just at the surface, we might be taking 70,000 observations every day. In comparison, at the time of D-Day, we might be taking 7,000 observations. So one of the things that makes this forecast so difficult is that you just, there was just not the ability to observe the atmosphere and see what was happening, even to understand what was happening now, let alone what would be forecast. So again, as a kind of example of that, what I've done is taken a picture and I've kind of only shown you a few pixels that represent about the amount of information that they would have had around D-Day. So here's an example. Anyone want to have a guess as to who that is? <laughs> no. So you can see it's incredibly difficult. And of course, it's a bit of a silly example. In reality, you have a bit more information. But it shows you, you know, you're really kind of looking through this kind of smeared window of what's happening in the real world. In comparison, here's the kind of picture we might have today. Anyone like to take a guess at who the picture of it is now? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> there we go. So, um, so you can see, you know, one of the things that's helped make our weather forecast so much better over the last, um, you know, since D-Day and certainly over the last 30 years is just the sheer amount of information we're able to collect about the atmosphere. Now, the other thing that was difficult about the information that we were collecting around D-Day is a great deal of it was at the surface. So we had very little information. The difficult thing about the atmosphere, of course, is it's, you know, it's many, many kilometers thick. What's happening several kilometers above the surface impacts what's happening at the surface. But it's hard to measure what's happening up there. You have to get your instruments up there on a plane or on a balloon. So here are some of the ways in which um, we were trying to measure that upper atmosphere um, around the time of D-Day. So obviously, we had um, reconnaissance flights going over, um, over the atmosphere around the UK. So we could uh, take some measurements then. Very close to the surface, we had kind of just the start of um, looking at the atmosphere using balloons. So one thing that, that was done a lot around this time was to use something called a pilot balloon. Um, so these two chaps here, who look very serious, are doing that. One of them's got a balloon, and one of them here has a theodolite, just like you might use uh, on a building site. What's going to happen is he's going to release this balloon. He's going to try and track it with the theodolite. And the chap with the clipboard is going to write down the numbers as he shouts them out as the balloon goes up. Now, you can imagine how difficult that is to do. That's something we get our undergraduates to do when they go on our field course. And they think we're completely sadistic for trying to get them to do this. It's, it's nigh and impossible to follow this balloon with a theodolite and read the numbers off. So this is a very difficult thing to do. But this, you know, when you're trained, this is something that was done routinely and was a very key source of information um, for the weather forecasts that were made. In fact, my, my father-in-law, so the Perez part of my surname comes from my father-in-law. Um, he's from Spain. His first job when he joined the Air Force was to do this. So sometime in the 1930s. Now, what we also had were just the starts of um, radio sondes. So the kind of typical weather balloon that, that, you know, an early version of the weather balloon that we have today. So uh, a package of instruments on this balloon sending by radio um, back to the ground information about the atmosphere as it goes up. Now, this is an advert from a US magazine in 1944. Um, and this is just really interesting to me, because this kind of shows you that radio sons were sort of like the smartphones of their day. So this company, Bendix, were kind of advertising how great their technology was because it could be used to, to you know, look at the weather to produce these radio sons. And in fact, in this advert, it says that you know, one of the impressive things about the Bendix technology is it, it can measure weather data controlling the time of offensives and hence the tide of war. So this was really new technology and really impressive technology at the time. So how much information did we have around D-Day you know, above the ground, this, these upper air measurements? So this is an estimate from um, a book written in 1984, which shows 
you know, there, were, there was a reasonable amount of data around looking above the surface. Not very much, but a reasonable amount. Now, what's also interesting, so this is um, some information that my colleague Adrian Simmons gave to me, is that although we know um, where a lot of the surface measurements are, we don't have such a good idea about where this upper air data is. It's probably in an archive somewhere. I think we think it's probably in an archive in the Met Office somewhere. But no one has actually been able to recover it to make use of um, for some of the forecasts I'll, I'll show you later. If we fast forward to today, of course, one of the big changes that we've had um, in terms of looking at the atmosphere is we now have really a plethora of, of satellites looking at the Earth um, from different geometries, looking at different things, looking at clouds or temperature or winds. And we have meteorological radars, another wartime technology, um, which, which really contribute a lot to our ability to forecast rainfall and storms on very short time scales. And again, what's also important about these technologies is that they're all very strongly networked together. So they're all passed back to um, national meteorological services. They're all um, passed, shared between different countries. And so we build up this really nice global picture of what's happening in the atmosphere. So I've talked for a bit. What I'm going to do now is give you something to do. So you hopefully all had a handout when you came in. And this is to kind of simulate what would happen if you were sat in the forecast office and you were receiving all this information. You're on the end of a telephone. Someone was telling you numbers. They were saying, you know, the pressure here is 996 millibars. It's falling by three millibars in the last three hours. And what you would have to do with that information is make a picture of what was happening in the atmosphere. So what I've given you are a few measurements in the kind of region that you might have been getting measurements at this time. And I've given you a low pressure. And this is a bit like pin the tail on the donkey. What I want you to do is try and put that low pressure where you think it should go on that map. So I'll let you all have a go at that. OK, everyone, everyone think they've got it? Everyone think they know where it should go? Um, I think it probably helps if you saw the play last night. You probably have an advantage <laughs> over people who are seeing it this night, uh, tonight. But um, OK, so it, you know, if I had a drum roll sound effect, I would do a drum roll. Um, so here we go. Here's the big reveal. It should be up here. Who got it up there? Hands up. Who got it up there? Pretty good. Who, who, who got it in completely the wrong place? Anyone, anyone care to admit to that? <laughs> <laughs> Not so much. You're just like my undergraduates. Um, <laughs> OK, so, but that gives you an idea of, you know, it, there's, there's so much an element of, um, of kind of decision making and thinking about the physics of what's going on just in, in even placing these systems because you don't have, you know, it's not like a photograph of the atmosphere that you have. You have very few measurements and you've got to kind of understand from all the measurements together your, your picture of the atmosphere and how it looks. Okay. Now, of course, one of the other interesting things, and unfortunately these didn't come out so well, but I'll explain what they are. Um, one of the interesting things about... Um, this forecast in particular is that the, the German weather forecasters at the time did not think that the weather would be suitable for an invasion. So they were somewhat less well prepared um, at the time. And one of the interesting things is that you, here are two um, contemporary weather maps. This is the Allied weather map, and this is the German version for the same day. And it doesn't really matter what's shown. What's interesting here is that. Um, on the Allied weather map, they actually have quite a lot of information for mainland Europe and in the oceans, whereas the German weather map you know, has a few, but, but pretty much is, is, is confined to the territory that they held at that time. And this is partly because, of course, um, the Allies had been very successful at breaking German codes. They were able to intercept um, messages, and they were able to intercept some of the weather information that the Germans were passing to each other. So, um, they, in some sense, because of that, had a bit of an advantage in terms of constructing these pictures in the atmosphere. There's also a very interesting story about the information that they had, which relates to Ireland. So, um, at the time, just at the, at the outset of war, there was a memorandum between the Irish government and the, and the UK government to say that uh, in the event of war... Um, the Irish would continue to provide their weather information, their weather observations, to the UK government. 
And some people say that's partly the reason that um, we didn't invade Ireland during the war. I'm sure there are other reasons as well, but <laughs> that, that, that's, that, that at least in meteorological circles is talked about. Um, so now what's interesting about that, of course, is you know, most of our weather comes from the West, and getting the observations from Ireland is pretty critical to understand what's going on. As you'll see later in the play, talking about the front that arrives and the difference between the low pressures is pretty dependent on those observations just on the west of Ireland. And a very nice story is that um, this place here, Bell Mullet, right on the west coast of Ireland, was really critical for this forecast. So this is um, a piece from an Irish newspaper in 91. And it says, um, it's an obituary for um, a gentleman called Ted Sweeney. It says, for many years before 1956, when the Meteorological Service opened an official weather station at Bell Mullet, Ted Sweeney and his mother, in addition to running the local post office, also provided regular weather observations of excellent quality for use in weather forecasting. And there are some other quotes about people visiting the post office and being told to, you know, wait for 15 minutes while, while the postmistress went out and made the, the observations that were so critical to the, to the weather forecast because they had to be done at the right time. And one of these weather reports in June 90, 1944 was destined to influence the course of history. So what, what's being talked about there is that the observations of the change in pressure, the gap between the two low pressures that you'll see later, came from Bell Mullet. So they came from this postmistress. In some senses, the, you know, the postmistress that saved the war, if you like. <laughs> <laughs> so we've talked a lot about the observations. Let's talk about this model. So you've got an idea of what's happening. And the weather forecasters, which we think about in the, in the play, they will have all had the same picture of what's happening. But what you've then got to do is, is have a model to take that forward, to make a forecast. Now, when we think about weather forecasting models now, we think about this. This is you know, a typically boring picture of a supercomputer at the Met Office. It's just a row of filing cabinets. But what we have is lots and lots of number crunching, lots and lots of lines of code to take all of our observations and make a weather forecast. Now, of course, the forecast that we're talking about at D-Day didn't do that. So what did they do? So here are a couple of lines from, from the play. So one of them says, I'm an admirer of the Bergen School, upper air structures. So what does that mean? And then Crick, Crick is very much interested in this idea of looking at previous forecasts, the analog method. So let's talk about Crick first. Um, now, personally, I found it quite hard to, to see exactly what Crick was doing, but the basic idea is, is shown here. So here's the map that um, one might have had on the 2nd of June. And then what Crick was doing is he was looking through a big um, set of weather charts, 40 years or so, and trying to find a day which looked very much like this one. And the idea was that if you could find a day that looked like that one or a collection of days that looked like that one, then the, the model, if you like, was that the same thing that happened after that day was going to happen in the future. So here's an example of a day he might have picked. This is the 9th of May, 1934. And you can see it has quite, you know, there are some differences, but there's some similarity. In particular, this ridge of high pressure, the Azores High is kind of over the UK. And so his forecast that he would have been thinking about, for this case, at least, have that high pressure staying around. They have that fair weather, that fine weather staying around. And that's, of course, the, potentially the course of his, um, his forecasts about it's OK to go on the 5th. It's OK that we can, we can carry on this... this um, this high pressure is going to prevent any storms from coming over the UK and, and, and disrupting the invasion. Now, Pettersen had a different view of what was going on. And as I say, Pettersen was um, one of the people in this Norwegian school, this Bergen School of Meteorology. And that school was really started by this guy, um, Wilhelm Björknes. He was a study of Hertz, for any of you who are scientists in, in the room. Um, and he did... He's just an amazing person. He did so many you know, pioneering things, not to do with meteorology, but particularly to do with meteorology. And he founded this school and trained lots of people um, to, to look at the atmosphere, to think about the atmosphere in a certain way. And here's an illustration of the, the kind of way that, um, that Björknes was trying to look at the atmosphere. So what they were trying to do is look, again, look at, look at lots of records 
but look at records of very particular storms and try and understand how those storms evolved, both by looking at all those records, but also by understanding the physics. Um, so here's an example of that. Here's a kind of picture of a typical storm. What does a typical storm look like? Here's the low pressure. Here's its fronts. There's cold air here and warm air in the center. And by understanding a bit more about the physics and mechanics of these individual storms, what they hope to do is then be able to say for any particular storm that they saw, um, how that storm would evolve in the future. Okay. And so this is the kind of where Peterson's interest in the upper air, so things happening above the surface, that's where his interest comes from, because he's a, a member of and follower of this school and these methods. And in particular, what he was interested in was comparing what was happening at, say, five kilometers with what was happening at the surface. Okay. So there are a couple of weather maps on here now. This is something like you've just seen. In fact, it's the same one. Here's our low pressure that we think um, you know, is pretty critical, may develop in terms of um, what happens on, on the 5th of June. And what Peterson and, and his colleagues would have been doing is comparing this weather map to another weather map uh, based on the observations taken five kilometers above the surface. And there are different features here. It looks a bit smoother. Here's this jet stream, the ri ribbon of very strong winds that are often talked about in the play. But critically, there's a low pressure system here, a trough here, and it's to the northwest of our surface low. And that's a fairly classic um, condition for development, for growth, for intensification of that surface weather system, which is so critical. And Stagg is trying to convince Crick in the play um, that he, he needs to look above. He can't just look at the surface. He needs to think about what's happening above, try and understand that. So how much do we know about what was actually used at the time of these upper air measurements? Well, here's a, a, a contemporary chart, which is supposed to be around the same day as this one. And you can see, actually, in terms of the structures here, that's pretty close. So the, the upper air picture that we had of the atmosphere was pretty good. But if you read some of the historical texts, there's some debate about actually, well, did we, did we, really, did we really know enough about using that information to really use it in the forecast? So it's perhaps something which is open debate. I, I would like to think that it was used, um, but I'm not a historian, so maybe I shouldn't comment on that. Um, OK. So there were the two models that we used at the time, this analog method and then this Bergen School kind of upper air method. But of course, there, were, there are other kind of currents around which were important for what's going to come later. So the first of these is this guy, Fry Richardson. Um, he was a Quaker and a pacifist. Um, and during the First World War, he was a stretcher bearer in Flanders. And actually, he did some of his most important work while he was a stretcher bearer in Flanders in his, in his off time. And one of the things he was very interested in was the idea that actually, how we can predict weather is by looking at the equations which govern the atmosphere and solving them mathematically. He had this idea of a forecast factory, a giant room filled with what he called computers, people making calculations and passing information on to each other. And of course, that is actually what we have here. Well, we haven't shrunk all the people down and put them inside the computer, but the microchips inside the computer are doing what these people would have done. The other thing for a modern weather forecast is that it takes into account this idea of chaos or uncertainty. And this idea came from experiments that Lorenz did. Um, what happened is he ran an experiment with a simple computer model. He went away, and then he wanted to start it again. And rather lazily, instead of taking the full number that the computer spat out, this is his original graph, what he did was he took a, a kind of rounded down version. Set it off running, went away, made himself a coffee, as the story goes, came back. And these two things had diverged. Now, I think most scientists in that, sense, in that case would have taken this piece of paper, screwed it up, thrown it away, and started again. But of course, the genius of the Wrens is that he realized that this was revealing something fundamental about systems like the atmosphere, that if you make a small error in your estimate of what's happening today, that could have huge consequences for what's going to happen in your forecast five or 10 days in the future. And the way that we capture that effect um, in modern weather forecasts 
is that we don't just make one weather forecast, we make 50 weather forecasts. We make 50 forecasts, all with slightly different starting points, and then by combining them together, we get an idea of how certain or uncertain we are. So let's cut to the chase here. Let's look at the forecasts that were, that, um, were made. And what I'd like to do, just to prove to you how hard I think the forecasts were, here are the charts for the 5th of June and the 6th of June. This is the key low pressure system and the gap between them, the marginal conditions which allowed um, the Allies to launch the invasion. What I want to do is compare that to a modern weather forecast of the same conditions. So here from the, the weather forecasting model is an estimate of kind of trying to copy these weather charts. So this is what the weather forecast model thinks was happening on those days. So you can see that's pretty good. It's got the low pressures in the right place. And all of that's fine and dandy. So what we'll do is we'll compare that weather forecast estimate with some modern forecasts. Now, these forecasts are made with the state-of-the-art weather forecasting model, the European Centre for Medium-Range Weather Forecast model. And they're made with the observations that were around on D-Day. So this is how, good, how well we could have done today, if we were doing it today with the same observations. This is the forecast 84 hours ahead. So this is the forecast that would have been made at the start of the play, on the 2nd of June. And if you look at this, this is pretty hopeless. OK? <laughs> so it gets the low pressures. It gets them there, but they're, they're of the wrong intensity. They're in the wrong place. So even with the best we can do today, with the amount of observations we have, we probably would have got it wrong. We probably, probably would have gone on the wrong day. Because this looks like a much better day, uh, sorry, this looks like a much better day to go on the 5th than on the 6th. And that's, what, that's the problem that Stag and the other people in the play are asked to deal with at the start of the play. Okay. If we get closer on, if we go 60 hours out now, so the forecast made on the 3rd of June, now our modern methods are getting a bit better. So this is pretty good. It's got things about in the right place. It's showing you that probably the 6th is, is marginal, but better than the 5th to go. If we go um, 36 hours ahead, then we really would do quite well these days. So this is almost, you know, almost identical. We get the full map. We get an idea of all the conditions. We can get the clouds, everything from today. So I think it was an incredibly difficult forecast for these people to make. Because even today, we would struggle to make that forecast. Now, just to give you a final um, kind of piece of information which will help you think about the play as you sit through it, I don't think this is mentioned in the play, but one of the alternative um, times in which the Allies might have gone was a bit later. The, the alternative date was, uh, I think, the 19th. And as some of you probably already know, um, there was a huge storm around that time, the night of the 19th and into the 20th. Um, and that storm, had, had the invasion been launched then, it would have been catastrophic. That storm was really a big storm in the context of storms in, in June over the whole century. And Stagg even, even refers to that in his book. Um, so he, he sort of very mildly puts, you know, during June the 19th, however, two unexpected things happen. But if you um, read a letter in the 90s from Lawrence Hogman, who was another member of the forecasting team, he thinks that they were very lucky. <laughs> so as an example of that, here's, again, a modern weather forecast of that storm. And what's been done here is we've used that weather forecast um, to drive a model of the ocean waves. How large would the ocean waves have been in the channel? around that time. So this is going to loop through. Um, and the, the, the colors here get up. So the reds are between two and a half and three meters high. So as you see, as we go through um, into the 19th and 20th, we would have had over large parts of, of the channel for the beaches that were important, we would have had these enormous waves. And in fact, this storm did cause problems for the Allies. In fact, it, it pretty much destroyed the Mulberry Harbour that was at Omaha Beach and left the 
the, the, the allies with only um, Mulberry Harbour B to use to get uh, material and troops uh, into northern France. And you can see that over this time, we go from really benign conditions in the channel to 4-7, 4-6 winds, um, you know, all sorts of terrible reports of what was going on at that time. So I just want to, to kind of leave you with that thought, really, um, to show you this was really a very difficult weather forecast to make. It's amazing that they were able to make any kind of weather forecast at this time to me. Um, and thank goodness they did make it, because this is the alternative, what could have happened if they didn't. So thank you.